For God has washed you wider than the driven snow. Through his shed blood, you stand righteous before the living God. Do not hearken unto that which would conquer you. For those things that are in your memories have been dealt by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Know that I am God and I love you. There's no greater love that I have for you that I sent my son to die for you. Know that you are loved and trust in me. Trust in me, trust in me. Know your ways are, are, are the ways that I've chosen for you and I will, I will be with you every step. Amen. Father, and again, I thank you, Lord, for the way you speak to your people. I thank you, Father, that you speak through your spirit, through your prophets, through your word, through your anointing. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. This is a day that you have made. We will, and may we all set our will to rejoice in you and be glad. Father, we don't want to be swayed by the ways of the world, but we want to be moved and motivated by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you have your way in our lives today. Holy Spirit, visit and knock at the door of the heart of every person that that door may open. And you will go in like a flood. Visit the heart, speak to the heart, rejuvenate the heart, cause revival from within the midst of each one of us, Father, that we will be a living testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray, Father, in your holy name. Amen and amen. Praise God and we welcome you here. At How powerful is the, is the blood of Jesus? I love it where it says, the old hymn writer said, what can wash away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is how powerful it is. And yet to some people, there are things more powerful than the blood in the church. And uh, Jesus made it very, very clear. He said, and your traditions have made the word of God of no effect. Tradition overrides everything else. We need to come back to have we are old time religion we need to come back to that where we first met Jesus Amen. where you first met Jesus keep, keep coming back over and over and over and over and over again I have been married seven times to the same woman I just keep falling in love with her and recommitting my life and my marriage to her and that's the same as what it should be with Jesus Christ. 
We just keep falling in love with him over and over. And I love, as we sung this morning, that chorus there, the goodness of God. Every time we sing, we sing that chorus, I feel and I sense inside of me my cup filling up and filling up and filling up even unto overflowing. And I want to operate in the overflow of the Holy Ghost. I'm not clancy of the overflow, but I want to be in the overflow of Jesus Christ. And it, 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 I don't want to give out of what I've got in Christ. I want to give out of the overflow. You see, many people and many Christians have a breakdown because they give out of, this, of, of themselves instead of giving out of the overflow. And when you give out of the overflow, your cup is still always full. And that's one of the things, remain, keep your cup full. Let it be full that your overflow is going to em embrace and infect the lives of other people. Infect the lives of other people. Last time I preached was a few weeks ago now. I don't get much time to preach in my own church. <laughs> Too many good preachers here today. And we're abundantly blessed. But when I was spoke the last time, I spoke on a subject and I just decided to this morning to resurrect it. I believe because God put it in my heart. It's love characteristics. So I wrote out very, very, very quickly the seven characteristics of love. And uh, I put up the first five. That is what we looked at last time. The first five, I don't know. Oops, 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 oops. Bring them all over. I'm hitting a piece there. Oh, come on. We'll get it there in a minute. Oh, it's sli it keeps sliding around. Sorry about that. How are we going? We're going to get it in a minute. Love is, is the evidence of the faith in Christ. And love is that which flows, and I'm not going to share with that again on what we have looked at, but it's the evidence. Secondly, that love is the proof of the life in Christ. The love we have for Christ is the proof and evidence that I live for him. Thirdly, I spoke on love is the stamp of genuineness, the genuineness inside of our life, and I accompanied those with scriptures. Fourthly, I spoke about love is motive, the motive power of service. Why do you serve God? Because he first loved you? What you can get out of it? Oh, it really works. He, if you do something good, he'll do something good for you. What is the motive? And lastly, we looked on is love is careful to obey. Love operates in obedience. Now, obedience has a wonderful dynamic uh, impact on our life. As... It says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, for the Holy Spirit was given to those who obey him. Now the Holy Spirit comes to Christians who are obedient. Now if the Holy Spirit comes to those who obey him, do you know what I discovered in my own Christian walk of life? The more I obey him, the freer the Holy Spirit flows inside of my life. Now, I had six years in the army back in the 50s, and I served in, in those six years, and one thing I learned was obedience, to receive orders, and as I learned to receive orders, I got promotion that I, I could give orders. And because I could give orders, it is because I was taught and trained and disciplined my life to obey. To those who cannot obey will find it very difficult in their own walk of life to continue to flow with the freedom of the Holy Spirit. They will always stand there with envy of other people, a good envy of other people saying, oh, I wish I could be like them. What's stopping you? 
Huh? What is stopping any of you? God is not the respecter of people. He doesn't love Pastor John over there. He's lovable. More than he loves Pastor Dave at the back and he's shovable. <laughs> no, he doesn't love one more than the other. But he loves what we do in the obedience of the Holy Ghost. And that's where he pours out his blessing and his love over our lives. Today I want to share with you number six. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. I'll just turn this off so you'll be concentrating on number seven. I may not even get there today. But love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now we all know what the fruit of the Spirit is, but just in case, let's open up our Bibles again to Galatians chapter 5. And in Galatians chapter 5, we are going to read from verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. When people look at you as a Christian, they should see love. Evidence of love. That you are different. You are the one who stands out in the midst of a crowd. Though it's a very difficult world we're living in today. It's joy. It's joy. It's peace. It's long-suffering. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's faithfulness. It's gentleness. It's self-control. And against such there is no such law. So those nine fruits of the Spirit are the package deal of love that God has given into the heart of every Christian believer. That is agape, Holy Spirit love in the package. Now when I do my shopping, I want to get everything I can in my package. And I want to get everything that Jesus Christ has prepared for me. I don't want half measures. I want the full measure of my heavenly Father. So as it tells us in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 3, it tells us one thing about first fruit is love. Now why is it love? For when I receive the fruit of love, when I receive the gift of love, I receive God because God is love. He's the package. God is love. 1 John 3, verse 1, it tells us God challenges the heart of each one of them. God is love. Let's have a look and see what does 1 John 3. And I've put down a few scriptures I want us to look at today. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. We all know these so very well. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. His goodness, his love. How much have you received of what God is pouring out over you? What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Now, God has bestowed love upon you, Rani. God has bestowed love upon you, Dorina. Ooh, you feel his love. It's liquid love pouring through your body. Receive that love that he has poured upon your life. And for every other person here, God has poured out love into your life. Let God, therefore, who has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Now, if you haven't received the love, you can't be called children of God. But as you receive the love of God, you know that you are a child of God. As Maxine receives the love of God. And Maxine, God wants to pour into your heart a new love. 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 And out of the new love, he's going to resurrect old loves. A new love will I give unto you. I will show you who I am. 
and the depth of my love for you, my daughter. Know me, call upon me, confess me, call me out loud by name. I am your saviour, I am the one, I am the holy one. Let me do what I want to do in you. I want to cause a new thing to spring forth in your life this day. Will you receive my presence? Will you receive my grace? And will you receive this love that I will teach you e even to love the unlovely with my love, says the Lord your God. Come on, God is, I'm a child of God. How do I know I'm a child of God? Because of his love. His love. It's so simple. You know, sometimes it, it, the simplicity of the gospel, people miss it because they're looking through the woods and they can't see the tree. They miss the mark of what God has said because he has called us to be children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us. Now, how much do we know the world? Because it did not know him. Beloved, now, verse 2, Beloved, now, you are children of God. Do you know the love of God? Has the love of God filled your being? Does the love of God fill your heart to overflowing? Or is there too many objects in your heart that's blocking the love of God to flow through your life? What is your commitment to that love? My commitment when I met my wife and married her <coughs> was to love her. I made that promise to love, honour and to cherish her. Oh, not to obey. Because <laughs> I discovered a long, long time ago I'm the head of the house. But my wife is the neck that turns me. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise God So what is it telling us? Love is so great Love is so wonderful Oh taste and see that the Lord is good How much have you tasted of him? How much do you communicate with him? How much do you meet with him? How much does he speak to you and you to him? What a challenge it is love. God is love. And what about joy? He's given me joy. One of the fruits of the spirit of one of the products of love is this, the characteristics of love, joy. King David, when he got salved, salvation, he backslid. Now this, there's many a Christian that are backslid but he came back to the Lord. That's the joy. And when he returned, when he came back to the Lord and he got salvation, what did he say? He said to the Lord, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Now, in salvation, there's God's joy to bring inside of us. It is a part of the Spirit. How excited are you that you have been saved? How excited are you that you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Saviour? How excited are you that he does the fighting for you? That's why he said he, he is, he, you are more than a conqueror. He has done all the fighting for us. He has won the every battle. There's a real excitement inside of my soul. Jesus Christ, he did, he gave a joy. I, the day I met Jesus... 1957, young lad, 20 years of age, serving in the army. I met Jesus. I was so ambitious to be a soldier. I went all the way through the Second World War years. I come from Tasmania. I remember, as I've told you before, how a Japanese plane flew over Hobart. My mum come racing out. We were playing in the street. She grabbed hold of us kids and raced us inside and we were all underneath the kitchen table. The fear on my mother's face, I never forgot to this day. See, she didn't know Jesus. 
She did later on in life, praise God. She didn't know Jesus, but she knew fear. And the fear on her face, because they were expecting the bombers to come in and start dropping the bombs. I went through the war. My uncle got killed in the, in the first intake of the bombing of Darwin. He got, bo- got killed. And so there was inside of me a hatred towards the Japs. But then when I joined the army, I was joined the army, I was ready to fight for, to the death for my life, for my king and my country. Or the queen, I should say, in those days. And uh, I was ready to do that. Until I met the King of Kings. Halfway through my army career, I met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I fell in love with him. My love, my desire, my passion to serve in the army was gone. My love and my passion was to serve Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. And out of that, I pioneered quite a few churches in my time because of love, love that motivates, love that keeps us going, love that keeps our relationship alive. Just like love in your relationship with your wife, your spouse. Keep that relationship going. So does that love. It puts a real joy inside of me. A joy to get up and speak about God. A joy to witness and testify of Jesus Christ. A real joy to tell people I'm saved. A real joy to tell people I'm not religious. Oh, that one gets them, always gets them in. I tell them, no, I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. And they want to know what's the difference between religion and Christianity. Oh boy, then you've got, for the next three weeks, you've got, you can just keep going. Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful thing you can tell them about. The joy of salvation. The joy of serving the Lord. The joy of knowing Jesus Christ. What wonderful joy we have. What a wonderful joy and privilege it is. As it says in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, and verse 52, it said this, And the disciples, that is the Christian believer, were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Joy and Holy Spirit come together hand in hand. People who have not received the joy is because they've lacked receiving the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And we need to receive both. You cannot receive half. When you go to the supermarket, you don't buy half a bottle of tomato sauce. Otherwise, you'd crack up. You don't buy those sort of things. Why do we need today to receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost? And it is the Holy Ghost, when he comes into your life, he begins to bubble. You know, when I first got saved... In the army, I'm in the army there, and after that day that I got saved and I got filled with the Holy Ghost at the same time, and uh, I went back to my camp base unit the next day, army headquarters in Canberra, and uh, they said to me, gee, you're bubbling. What's bubbling in you? You're different. They noticed I was different. Why? Because there was a joy inside of me. There was an excitement inside of me, and it's never stopped. 66 years later, and it's still going strong because joy will never give up. Joy always reproduces more joy. And so the disciples, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So joy and the Holy Ghost, they go hand in hand. They were filled. They were made complete is what it comes from. From the Greek word means there was now a completeness being done inside of their life by the joy that only the Holy Spirit can bring. King David tastes of it and he said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, but restore it. Come on, Lord, bring back to me. 
This is the package. Come on, what is the package? How much have you got in the package? How is your scales weighing in the presence of the Lord? Have you received the fullness that God's got for those that love him? You might say, I know Jesus, but I know my next door neighbour. But I want to more than know him. I want to have an intimate relationship with him. So he said, therefore, not only will God give unto you joy, but peace. Why? Because he is our peace. He is our peace. He's broken down every wall. He is our peace. What a wonderful peace Jesus Christ gives. You know, in circumstances and situations in life, when you should be troubled and disturbed yet, through the Holy Ghost, there's a peace that passes all understanding. That peace of God that passes all understanding, how do you explain it? You can't. I can't explain it. Just the same as I can't explain how when hands were laid upon me one day and I started praising God and suddenly I spoke a foreign fluent language I never learnt before in my life. How did it happen? I don't know. Except God did a miracle. So to every person who has ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, they can say, can never, ever, ever say, I've never had a miracle from God. They have all had a miracle from God because God is a miracle working God. God wants to perform miracles in your life. And if you've never received that fullness of God, You'd, it's like the old Negro woman said about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's better felt than felt. I can't tell to people how it is. But when you receive this joy, when you receive this peace, when you receive this love, your life becomes a new dynamic in the presence of God. And so God wants us there to continue on with this and how do we go keep going? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, long-suffering. Now, long-suffering is not suffering long. Don't put the cart before the horse. Long-suffering is something about perseverance. You know, before I became a Christian, I, was, uh, I had was uh, very impatient, an impatient person. But being in the army, that started to train me. That was training me to be a patient person because in the army you had to do everything by paperwork and paperwork went very slowly. Went very, very slowly, so that, so that taught me. But when I became a Christian, I learned patience and, uh, and being long-suffering in all things before God. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and, uh, and it says this in verse 6, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the sincere love of the working of the Holy Spirit, you have long-suffering. Now I know why my wife can put up with me. She's got long suffering. And she thought it was suffering long. <laughs> By purity. Pure. Because to the pure, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, said, to the pure, all things are pure. All things are pure. To the pure. You see, how does your mind think? What do you focus on? Is your mind focused on the Lord or the things of the world? Because if your mind is focused on the things of the world, you think the way the things of the world. But if your mind is, think, is focused on Jesus, then you think the way Jesus thinks. And what would Jesus do in every situation in life? You come back to Christ by the focus to which we have. You receive new knowledge, a heavenly knowledge, Receiving the package deal, okay, God, 
of the package deal is I, I now can handle situations in my life that I couldn't handle. I don't get very phased by things, I don't think of. By these, I, everything else I've learned, I learned to let them roll. I remember when I first got married to my wife and something happened and, and, uh, and she says, stop justifying yourself. Me? I said, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. No, no. Yes, you are. No, no, not me. This is what the scripture says. And then suddenly Jesus spoke to me and said, but David, I was like a lamb led to the slaughter and I opened not my mouth nor reviled again. If I can't justify you, who can? If I can't justify you, who can? You can't. But Jesus can. Learn to flow and walk with him. Learn to talk with him. Learn to receive from him. Receive from him the goodness, the gentleness. Let's receive from him the gentleness, the gentleness of God. And what is the gentleness of God? The gentleness of God is so simple. How gentle is our God? The gentleness of God. As the scripture says, this in Ephesians 2 and verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness or gentleness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, looking at that again, no doubt 2,000 years ago when uh, this Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, that in the ages to come, for 2,000 years plus are gone, that age has now come. That age, we're now living in that age. Today is that age that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. How much are you receiving through love the riches of his grace? His grace. Because his grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. You know, if you've got the grace of God, you've got more than enough. More than enough to conquer anything. His grace is sufficient. And his goodness, his kindness towards us, his gentleness towards us. For by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. By grace you're not going to be saved, but by grace you have been saved. Amen. By grace you have been saved. Possess your possessions. As Obadiah said there in, in uh, it was only one chapter in verse 17 and section C, he said, let us go and possess our possessions. How many times have Christians got possessions, the inheritance that they've been given of God and they don't go in the door and claim it? They don't go in the door and claim their possession, their equal rights and their rights of their inheritance in God. Now let us go through and possess what God has given to us and we can claim the goodness of God, the gentleness of God. It is a part of the character of the love of Christ. You see, many of us, no doubt, here today, have got some of these characteristics. But it's not one or two or three or four, but it's all. Do you want all that Jesus has got for you? Do you want all that Jesus has got for you? Or are you just content just eating a couple of grapes off the vine when he's given you the vine? So now you are bought for by grace you have been saved through faith. 
Now, whose faith were you saved by? Your faith? No, you were justified by the faith of the Son of God. You were justified by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus Christ believed in his heart, sincerely and wholeheartedly. He knew those who were called to be his chosen. As I've told you in the, in the Christian church, many are cold and few are chosen, but many are cold and few are frozen today in the church. We're called and chosen to follow God. He called us out. He chose us before the foundations of the world was laid. My name was written in heaven. But now I had to make my decision. Will I, the same as Joshua made it, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As the jailer said, and that if you believe, you and your household will be saved. We've got to make that decision in love for Christ. How much do we love Jesus? How much do we really love him? Through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The gift of God is faith. Now God has given to every man the same measure of faith. All of us have been meted out the same measure of faith. Let's use it in conjunction with the faith of the Son of God that was given through love. He loved you so much. He loved you so much. Before the foundations of the world was laid, he was prepared to leave his Father in heaven. And yet how much did he love God? He loved God. He was a part of God. And God is love. And yet love left heaven to come down to earth to willingly die, to give you resurrection power and authority and to put back in your heart and that take away from you that stony heart and put in you the heart of flesh and the heart of flesh that is passionately in love with Jesus. It's not a fairy tale. It's a meeting with Christ. It is a meeting with Christ. That's why Moses was able to stand out because he had a meeting with Christ, a meeting with God. Not only did he go up the mountain, he went into the mountain. And we need to go into Christ and receive the fullness of what Jesus has prepared for us. And then number six, the goodness. Goodness. We sung it. I love that song, as I said. The goodness of God. Every time I hear it, my heart fills up. My eyes begin to weep. When I look there and I re reappraise and reevaluate everything again, Lord, how much do I really love you? Thank you, Lord, for the love you've given unto me. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me, put me. The last thing in the world I ever wanted to be was a preacher. And yet, Lord, I love you and you put me here and I serve you to the best of my ability. I serve you, Lord, with the goodness of God. The goodness of God, how much do we have with the goodness of God flowing through us? The goodness of God. Paul, when he wrote to, uh, uh, um, wrote to the uh, church of Thessalonica, he said in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11, he said this, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of the calling worthy of the calling and, full, uh, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. His goodness. God wants to put his goodness into us and the work of faith with power. So the goodness of God comes with the working of power and faith, comes into us and it's with love. With love. With love. How much now of this love have you received? You know of it. How much of the package? How much, oh, what I want today is not for you to hear a lot of words, but go away with a package now that you've done your shopping today and you're real content. My package is full with the goodness and the love of God. 
that he shared abroad. I never realized his love was so vast. And yet his love will complete and suffice for whosoever's the goodness of God. The goodness of God and the work of faith is the goodness of God operating inside of us through love. And it operates inside of you through love. And not only did it go on to say that number, 70 said, and faithfulness. And faithfulness. Now, when you met Jesus, you made a stand for him. But where do you stand today for him? Hmm? You made a stand for him, but where do you stand today? Do you still stand on holy ground? God said to Moses, take off your shoes for the ground on which you stand is holy. And God said to the Christian believer, now in, in Ephesians there he said, now have your feet shod with the gospel of preparation when you stand on holy ground for me. And have it, your gospel of preparation filled with the love of Christ. The love of Christ. In my early days when I became a Christian, I tried to preach too much to the people. And then after a period of time, God said to me, now demonstrate my love. Then I started to have the church growing. Growth. Not through how much you know, but how much you love. It's not knowledge of the world. It's not knowledge of the scripture. It's because the scripture can be black and white or also can be written in the blood of Jesus. The scripture can become a law and, a re and regulations. But how faithful are you? Jesus, when he said in, in Luke's gospel, chapter 18 and verse 8, he said, and when I return, shall I find the faithful? Shall I find the faith? When I return, shall I find the faith? He's coming back. 2,000 odd years are gone. We're living in years, in, in the days where it's scary. For 60 odd years of my Christian walk of life, I said, Jesus Christ is coming back. I've said it because that's what I was taught. That's what the Bible says. But now I'm believing it because I see everything around me. It's closer than ever before in my walk of life. And he said, now when I come back, I'm not going to come back for a church as in such. I'm not coming back for religion. I'm coming back for the faithful. Those who are faithful and filled with my love. Not going to church doesn't make you a Christian. If you think it does, go and sit in my garage for six months and see if it'll make you a motor car. No. Come on. It's your personal commitment and relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, put these package together. What a beautiful look at the vine that he's holding to you. It is not only a vine, it is divine. And hanging from that divine is for each one of us his love, his joy, his peace, his long suffering, his gentleness, his goodness, his faithfulness. Because he had enough faith to know that when he went inside the bowels of the earth, he would rise again with exceeding power. Megathon is the Greek word. Megathon power, which today megathos is, is in atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs. Megathos, electrifying, dynamic, explosive power for the faithful when they're ready and watching and waiting and prepared for that glorious day. And the eighth one he said is meekness. Meekness. Now meekness is not weakness. Quite the contrary. God said, for Moses was the meekest man in the whole world. Now before God could make that statement, he had to check the heart of every single person living on planet Earth. He could not have just said it 
like that. He had to check the heart. And Moses was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. If you looked at the story and the life of, uh, of uh, Moses, you would see there he was a great warrior, a great man, a man of character, a man of, of judgment, a man of, of uh, stature. But he was humble and meek. He had that meekness in God, the meekness. Meekness is what he had that kept him to flow. Because Moses had meekness, that's why God was able to use him. There were many men that God could have chosen to lead Israel out from Egypt, lead Israel out yet, and here it is, there's one thing you can know. God used a man that was meek, meekness, and God also used a man that was a basket case. There it is, come on. He floated on water. But very meek. So meek was he. And he says this in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But you, but you, who was he talking to when Timothy was writing? Was he talking to the individual? Is he talking to the church of the 20th, 21st century? But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Start getting your focus right. Stop looking around everything else. If there's love inside of you, project your love back to heaven. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith. Pursue the love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and haven't confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What is your good confession in the presence of many witnesses? One day we're going to stand before him. I don't want to stand before him or I don't want to get cremated and in my cremation here, the words, well done, David, they want me well done when I'm cremated. No, I don't want to be well done. I want to hear well done from Jesus. I want to hear it from Jesus. I want to be well done and put into an urn. I want to be well done, O oh, true and faithful servant. Well done. Well done, David. Well done. You did your best. Now, that's all God asks. Every Christian to do is their best. And you know what I discovered? Your best varies from day to day. Your best today may not be acceptable tomorrow, but it will be tomorrow as your best that you can do. But remain in that meekness, that meekness before God. Mean, your meekness before him. And temperance, the ninth one was temperance which is out of temperance, self-control. Who is in control of your life, you or another? Who governs, who controls your life? Is it you or is it another? For it says these words, but also, oh sorry, in 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. Also for this very reason, giving all diligence. How much diligence do you give to God? In the world affairs around you, how much do you focus on those or do you focus on Jesus? Out 
add to your faith virtue. Virtue, what is virtue? Virtue comes from the uh, Greek word um, aphane, which is, uh, simply means manliness, valour and excellence. Can you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm serving you and I'm giving you my ex all of my excellence, the best I can do, the best you can do today, the best you can do tomorrow, next week or last week, what is it going to be? What is your best? Do you give him your best or second best? There is no second best in God. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge brings, that knowledge of heaven brings self-control. Self-control. I am in control. I am led by the Spirit of God. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Why do I want to be led by the Spirit of God? Because the Scripture says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they truly are the children of God. So get into the Holy Ghost. Get filled with the love of God. Get filled with the fullness of the agape, the Holy Spirit love, that you can have control. You are controlled and motivated by the Holy Ghost. <coughs> So when you say, I have got love of God, how many of those characteristics do we carry? How many of the characteristics do we show? What is the evidence? Is the evidence, to, to, to those of you here today that are married, you can say to your spouse, I love you, but does that suffice and sufficient enough to prove that you really love them? No. It's got to be, there's got to be evidence of your love. Don't just come to church and say, Lord Jesus, I love you, and leave. But where's the evidence of your love for him? Jesus said to Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know all things, three times. Peter got a little bit annoyed in the end because Jesus asked him three times. Twice it was filio and once it was agape. Holy Spirit love. How much do we really love Jesus? Is he your all? Or not at all? Father, we thank you, Lord, that Jesus is the answer to every need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, you are all that I need. Oh, I know I need money, I need a house, many things I need, but Lord, not at the expense of you. You are all I need, and the other are the blessings beyond. Father, I thank you for the challenge you give to your people. I thank you, Lord, for the word you speak. May each one of us receive the word. I thank you, Father, for the anointing that you said you have placed upon us. Father, you said that you have placed an anointing upon your people, but you have the anointing. Father, may each one of us rise up, exercise that authority of the anointing you have placed over us, and may your word flow through us and the evidence of your love be prominent in our lives.